Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Step through the hourglass of time. Past, present, future combine, intertwine as the signs on a path lead you towards love or away from wrath. Motivation, that's individual. Gravitation, that's residual. A cosmic echo from a prayer you made before your very birth. The questions fly from souls confused, the tears they fall from hearts abused by social mores, genderisms, and CNN. But God is on your side, and these hijabis walk with pride, and Malcolm said he even heard some blue-eyed soul. Allah who Akbar is his song, the dawn it wants for you to yawn and stretch and wash and pray and wash and pray and pray. Walk to him. He'll run to you. Say I'm sorry. He'll say times two. And even hide your sins from men who eat dead flesh. That longing that you feel within. Beneath the soot behind the grin. Sometimes trapped in words you spin won't go away. Listen and embrace. It's the harbinger of grace. It's that sun on the horizon. Darkness falling. The noor is rising. And what's left is that natural you within. You see, the movement of your tongue from birth was really just a rung, a step, a stare, a sojourn to heights once unknown, or perhaps only covered by nurturing mothers and dastardly others. Look at what you've discovered, a powerful beckoning that shakes souls like the reckoning. What's that feeling that hit you, that knowledge that gripped you? The name of the spiritual picture is called your fitra. Exactly. Okay. That piece, fitra, for the non-Muslims that are here, it is well known in Islam that you're born on the fitra. In other words, you're born with a natural inclination to worship one and only one God. Everyone. And it's only your upbringing that will take you out of that fold. Especially for our non-Muslims that are here and you know, recognizing that call that might be, be there within you, whether you're, Mus whether you're you know, Muslim or non-Muslim. No matter what, just know that, you know, Allah is always there. You know, return to him. You know, walk to him, he'll run to you. On October 11th, 1977, Muta Wasin Shabazz Beale, more commonly known as Napoleon, was born. His place of birth, the Brick City, Newark, New Jersey. His mother, Akila, was Christian and his father, Salik, was Muslim. When he was three years old, his parents were murdered and his brother, Seiki, committed suicide. After this, he moved with his two brothers to his grandmother's home in Irvington, New Jersey. As Muta grew older, he started rapping. In 1994, he ran into his childhood friend, whose godbrother was the notorious rapper Tupac Amaru Shakur. His mother, Yasmin Fula, told Tupac about Beal. He was told of the death of Muta's parents and the story of his upbringing. This moved the well-known rapper, and Muta joined his rap group, the first incarnation, Dramacidal. In 1995, Tupac's now classic hip-hop album, Me Against the World, was released, with Muta making a guest appearance on the song Outlaw. Later in 1995, Muta, with several other MCs, formed the group Outlaw Immortals, which was later renamed The Outlaws. Tupac gave each member of the group an alias taken from what he called an enemy of America. He gave Muta the alias Napoleon after French Emperor Napoleon. Oh, okay, all right, we in college, all right. Good, good. <laughs> Napoleon continued to make guest appearances on several tracks and was also the center of attention in Tupac's famous song, I Ain't Mad At You," which has now become an anthem, right? I ain't mad at you. Here, Tupac talked about how Napoleon became a strong Muslim 
who always try to do good. So those of you who are familiar with that particular track, you now know who the Muslim was. You know, oh, you a Muslim now. No, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know that song. I know you do. You're not fooling me. So now you know who, who was the subject. In March 1997, Napoleon and most of the outlaws signed with Death Row Records, despite Tupac's disapproval. And in 1999, the outlaws released their debut LP, Still I Rise. Subsequent LPs followed, including what was to be Napoleon's solo debut album, Bonaparte's, featuring John B. and Sticky Fingers. At this time, however, Napoleon decided to retire from music. Napoleon currently resides with his family and children in Los Angeles, California, running a barbershop and salon, Platinum Cuts. So if you're ever in L.A., look up Platinum Cuts. So there's a plug for you, Napoleon. And is also working on setting up a mosque. This is a more important plug. Setting up a mosque for people who are interested in becoming Muslims. Alhamdulillah, that's, that's a wonderful thing that our brother is doing. So at this point, it is my pleasure and my honor to have been asked to introduce our dear brother in Islam, Muta Wasin Shabazz Beal, a.k.a. Napoleon. When I was three years old, my parents got killed by my so-called godfather. So I was in the house. I was three years old. I got shot in the foot. I had a six-month-old brother, and I had a four-year-old brother in the house. Alhamdulillah, you know, nothing happened to us. We was, after, the, after the death of my parents, I moved to Irvington, New Jersey with my grandparents. The people that killed my parents, they was from a, they was from a, group, uh, they was from a group of people called the Nation of Islam. So at this time, when I moved to my grandmother, they was Christian. So I kind of, you know, of course, my mother and father, being that we passed, when they passed away, I was young. I had no influence and no teachings of Islam. So I was raised with my grandparents that was, they was Christians. They was Christians. So eventually they started teaching, preaching um, Christianity and trying to force it upon us. So growing up in Irvington, New Jersey, in a household, with a, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a bunch of us in one household, me, a couple cousins and things like that. When we started getting up to, up to age, we started hanging on the street like everybody else in, in the city. You know what I mean? When you get bored. You start hanging in the streets and things like that. But at a young age, I was trying to figure a way to get out of the hood. I was seeing people that, you know, growing up with that they was turning into drugs, drug selling, stolen cars back in the day. This was happening around my way. But I always wanted to get away to get away from this lifestyle and get out of there. So one of the things I started doing, I started writing. And one of the thing, persons that inspired me, we had a female, we had a family friend by the name of Queen Latifah. So when she used to come over the house, I used to see her come over the house, man. And then a couple months later, a year later, I heard on the radio. So when I heard on the radio, I said, man, she was just in my living room. She, she made it. I think I I can make it. Let me just start getting serious with writing and things like that. So I started getting serious. Even to the point, like, I started performing at the local areas, the local house parties in my neighborhood, and um, just rapping on the block and things like that, man. Rapping for a dollar here. Brothers giving me a dollar here, two dollars here to say rats for them. But when I started getting serious... I had a childhood friend by the name of Gaddafi. This is this is the half brother of Tupac, and from 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 a childhood friend, we when we grew up, we um we lost contact with each other. So a couple years later, when I became a teenager, I ran into his mother. I ran into his mother out here in Newark, and she I asked about Gaddafi. I said, "Where's Gaddafi?" Um, you know, she told me that Gaddafi is living in Atlanta now, and he also he also does rap music. And I told her, I said, I said that's cool because I'm trying to do rap music. She said, as a matter of fact, Gaddafi got a brother named Tupac. Did you ever hear Tupac? I said, yeah. This is when Tupac first came out with strict. He had the album Tupac is now and strictly for something. You know, <laughs> strictly for my I can't say it, but so he came out with this. He can't. He came out strictly for my niggas. It's not a curse word, you know. Some, you know, some people is really that. I would be lost. So, but he came out with these albums. So I heard of them. And, um, she told me that that was his half brother, and they coming to New York real soon. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna give him the number so when they come, you can meet him. Like the brother said in the biography. So when Tupac came to New York, he already heard about the story. So I guess hearing about the story of my mother and father kind of softened his heart. We said, I want to meet this kid and things like that. So eventually, after that, Tupac got he got he got shot in New York, and then he got arrested. So when he got arrested in New York, I was still down in Atlanta. 
and he was and we were still doing music with the rest of the group and um with me Gaddafi is a, it was another member named Idi Amin who's a cousin of Tupac alhamdulillah Idi Amin is a, he took shahada now alhamdulillah and Castro who was Tupac cousin so we was doing music down there and waiting to Tupac come home when Pac got released from jail he signed a record deal with Death Row Records. I'm sure people heard of Death Row Records. I'm sure the people heard of Death Row Records. So he said, when I come home, we're going to move to Los Angeles. And we, we, we signed a deal with Death Row Records. At this time, Death Row Records was one of the, the most powerful record labels within rap music in the world at that time. You know what I mean? It was selling the most records out of anything. So it was a big move for him, for the dunya. Now I'm 14, 15 years old. We went to Los Angeles. This is the part of my life that, like I said, things started really changing. And like I said, I had no mother and father. I had no curfew. I had nobody to pull my coat. And I'm in Los Angeles, and it's around millionaires. I'm from the block one day, nothing but millionaires and, and cars and millionaires and mansions and things like that, and drugs and alcohol, all type of things that you can imagine. It was just like freedom. You know what I mean? It's, it, we thought we was on top of the world. So when we, start to death row, when we went to Death Row Records, I really kind of spin out of control. I started getting real, 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 real heavy into alcohol and things like that, man. Every night partying, we started getting to that level. And, and you know, we started doing more music. I did more music with Tupac. He came out with an album called All Eyes On Me. And from that album, we I performed some songs on it where we he sold 10 million records. That was good for him and his dunya. I'm not saying it to brag. I'm just breaking it down because the brother told me to break it down from A to Z. So when he came out with that record label, with that record, it was a, it was a successful record for him at that time. And eventually, like they say, man, everything that's good got to come to an end eventually. You know what I mean? So Tupac got released from jail in 95. And then 1996, he was in Vegas one, time, one day. And that's when he got assassinated. He got murdered. Being that the people that we is affiliated with, some of the people that we is around, they was affiliated with certain gangs. You know what I mean? We was affiliated with people from this gang and the people from another side of the gang. They, they murdered Tupac. They assassinated Tupac in Las Vegas. At that part of my life, things changed because, like I said, Pac was like a father figure to me. He really was like a brother figure. To me. He was one of the dudes that I can, I really can say that when he was living, he was trying to keep us under control. He was trying to do good deeds. But as a Muslim man, if, you, if your deeds not according to the Quran and the Sunnah, then it will be rejected if it's not according to the religion of Islam. But at that point in my life, I didn't know nothing about the religion of Islam. I just knew that the people around me, Pac, he, he was a real good brother. He was, he was, he took me out of the hood. He, he took care of my family. And now that he's gone. I started thinking I was about 16 years old 17 years old And I said I don't want to go back to Jersey So now it's time for me To be a man All the way out here In California on my own And try to make it But it shocked me Because I said Look here Pac died Just so A couple days ago We was we were just around each other A couple days ago I remember sitting with Tupac And I remember He used to do a lot of music And his music And a lot of his music He used to talk about death Like people that used to Listen to music And it might be some Non-Muslims And Muslims in here Or there be a lot That still listen to his music But he talked about death a lot And I remember Right before he passed away we was in his house He felt good Because he just he, he just purchased a house On the beach And everything And he's sitting in his house He said Now that I have all this I don't want to die He said I know all the time I had this thing in me Where I, I wanted to die All my music I talk about death He said To be honest Now I don't want to die A couple weeks later A week or two later That's when he got assassinated In Las Vegas So just remembering that And I remember his saying I said Man I remember he saying That he don't want to die And now that he passed away And he had no control over it he had no control over his life. I started getting curious and I started saying, you know what, I need to find out because I know we're going to drop dead. I seen people growing up in Irvington and Newark that I was with one day and he dead the next day. I said, I need to find out where we're going to go when we drop dead. Because even though I never was a dummy, man, I never had a religion, but I never, I believed that in the higher power back then. And I believe that you can't just live a life and just drop dead and that's over. Even before I became a Muslim, I said, ain't no way in the world a person could just live his life the way he wants to live his life, and a, a he or she according to what they want to do, and when they drop dead, it's it. They just in eternity asleep. That, that, that doesn't make sense to me.
So I started trying to research and I started praying to God and I started, you know, asking God, if you're a God, if it's a God out there, just guide me to the truth. I just want to know what's the truth. So coming back after Pop passed away a couple months later after that. Gaddafi, he's the brother, right before Pop passed away, as a matter of fact, my grandmother who raised me passed away like three months before him. Then Gaddafi, he's the guy who introduced me to Tupac. He got murdered by my cousin. It was an accident about two months after Tupac died. And then a couple months after that, my brother, I had a brother who committed suicide. So it was like back-to-back, back-to-back death. So that really, really opened my heart, man. And I said, man, I, I need to get it together, man, because people dropping dead left and right around me. And it's funny because one day I was in a recording studio, and I was intoxicated. And I'm telling this to the kids. I'm, I'm breaking this down to the kids because I just want to be straight up with y'all. I'm not saying it's like this is the thing to do, that go ahead and get intoxicated. Maybe one day you'll be able to get when you're 13, 14, 18, 19, 20, you can stop drinking and go to Hajj. Because sometimes a lot of us that come from Muslim family, this is what we think. Man, we can have a lot of fun, man. And some coaches, they think Hodge is for old people. Man, I can get drunk now, and when I'm 50, I go to Hodge, and that's it. But we don't ever know when the angel of death going to snatch our soul. So it's, 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 we don't even want to play with that. You know what I mean? Because you don't want to drop dead the day that you try to experience with some drugs or something like that. You don't even know if you're going to drop dead that day. So I'm trying to tell the kids, don't even try, don't even play with it. Especially the Mus- especially all the kids, man, but especially the Muslim kids. So I was in, I was in the studio, and I got in a fist fight with my little brother. And it happened to be a studio, it happened to be a Muslim in a studio in the, uh, who broke the fight up. He was in the parking lot in the studio and he broke the fight up. And I remember just having so much anger in me. Like, growing up, I had so much anger, but I used to try to, I was like, every day, man, I'll just get intoxicated. Wake up the next morning, probably did something that I'm ashamed of, so I run and get drunk again, man. Like, man, I just, like, I was living a life that I didn't even want to be sober no more. Like, I wanted to stay numb as best to my ability. I said, I have to stay numb every day. So the brother who broke the fight up, he talking to me, said, what's your name? I said, I said, Muta, I'm from Jersey. He knew it was a lot of Muslims in Jersey. He said, are you Muslim? I said, yeah, I'm Muslim. I don't know nothing about Islam. All I knew was about the nation of Islam, and I said, I can never be a Muslim because Muslims kill my parents. So when he started talking to me, he said, I'm going to invite you over to the Masjid. You come to the Masjid. And when I came to the Masjid, you know, I seen different people there. I seen the brotherhood that I never seen before. You know, of course, in the music industry, we all claim that we have brotherhood. But once the money start kicking in, it always get the brotherhood breaks up real easy. So when I seen the brotherhood of the Muslims, I was surprised. And I said, you know what? I want to go home and I want to study Islam more. I'm going to go get the Malcolm X video. And this time I'm going to watch it sober. I said, I'm going to watch it sober, man. So when I watched it and when I seen what Malcolm X did when he went to Hodge and when he came back and didn't, and when he, when I noticed that he, how he exposed the nation of Islam and, that, and um, I started getting the teachings of the nation of Islam and the teaching of Islam and I know that there was two different belief systems. I know that Islam teaches you that God is one. That he's the creator of the heavens and the earth. That he's not a male, he's not a female. Nothing in the heavens, nothing in the heavens and the earth is like Allah. There is nothing like God. And Islam, the nation of Islam was teaching that God is a black man. He walked in Chicago one day, he had a suit on with a bow tie and things like that. It just didn't make sense to me. So I started saying, you know what, I really want to get deep into this. I cannot, I cannot go say the, the heck with a whole religion because of what some people did. So the more I started learning about Islam and the more I started noticing that it was two different religions. That Islam was the truth Islam, it doesn't preach um, racism. It doesn't preach worshiping a man. It doesn't preach, it's telling you to pray to God alone who created the heavens and the earth. And it's telling you that he created Adam first. And from Adam, he created his wife Eve. And from them two, he created countless of generations and numerous of people on the face of the earth. So I said, man, this is just natural. It makes sense. This just makes sense so natural that even though I didn't know too much about it, I said, man, the God that I want to pray to is a verse in um. Ayatul Kursi, where Allah said that he's the creator of the heavens and the earth and that he rose over his throne and he created the heavens and the earth and he feels no fatigue in protecting it. And I remember, I remember, I remember my grandmother, you know, being that I was a Christian and the religion, I'm not, I'm not here to shoot shots at nobody religion, but the truth is the truth. And I remember in the religion, my grandmother used to say, well, God, God made the heavens in seven days, six days, and he took a rest on the seventh day. So even growing up, I said, man, God get tired. It just really didn't make sense to me. So when I read about Islam, when Allah said that he feels no fatigue, that he, does, he doesn't get tired, I said, this is the Lord that I want to pray to. A God that when I'm up, I don't want him to be asleep when I'm praying to him. He doesn't get tired. So I started trying to get more into Islam and started reading more about it. And I said, as a matter of fact, I watched the Malcolm X video and I said, I want to go to Hajj. When I seen Malcolm X, I said, Alhamdulillah, I want to go to Hajj. I didn't really know too much about Hajj. I just got up some money and I went to Hajj. 
And when I was walking down Hodge, I seen two brothers, one of the brothers right here, not to put him on the spot. I knew this brother since I was a kid. I didn't know he was Muslim. I'm walking down the street in Medina University, brother, his name Abdul Ali, but we know him as Wap, you know what I mean? So when I see him walking down the street, I'm looking at him, and he's looking at me, and he said, where you from? I said, Irvington. He said, man, you in the middle of Saudi Arabia. What you mean, Irvington? Nobody don't know what Irvington is. And then the next thing I know, he looked at me like, wait a minute. And we clicked from there. I said, man, what you doing out here and things like that? And it was a blessing. And then I ran into another brother that I knew from Gaddafi. His name was, um, we used to call him Beans. His name was Shadi Muhammad. And when I ran into that brother, he's a, he's a student at the University of Medina. It was a blessing because when I ran into these brothers, I didn't know too much the rights of Hajj. They started teaching me the rights of Hajj. They started telling me to do this and do that, man. With Literally, it was a blessing because the brothers I was with, they didn't teach me nothing about Hajj. And the books that I was reading, it wasn't it wasn't authentic. It wasn't it wasn't authentic. See, you know what I mean? It wasn't the truth about how you perform Hajj. So it was a nitma for my life that I ran into these brothers. I got excited. I started calling Jersey, putting all my brothers on the phone. Like, look who's out here in Medina, in Saudi Arabia, and we were soup, you know. So after that. I came back. I came back to America, man. And, and when I tell the people I came back, man, it was it's a it real talk, man. That I felt so good that nothing on the face of the earth never made me feel the way I felt. I was I really really thought it was the Zamzam water. I was telling people, man, it's something in that water. But it's, it's, it gets you this feeling that nothing in the face of the earth had me that feeling, man. Wallahi, I was I thought it was a Zamzam water. I'm talking about to the point I was running it every day. Like I got to get some more of this. Huh? <laughs> so alhamdulillah, man. When I came back. I remember the feeling that I had, man, and I started hanging around the wrong people, and I started going back into the recording studio, and eventually, I remember that feeling just disappeared, and I started saying, man, wait a minute, I used to feel so good, man, and all of a sudden, that feeling is gone. Even when the Prophet Sallallahu said that a man is on a religion of his friend. The man is on the religion of his companions. And I noticed that time that I was around Muslims, but there was Muslims that had me back in the recording studio. And eventually, I started feeling right back the, the, the way I was back in the day, man. So I started doing music, like I said, and I started getting to the point where I started doing music. We, 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 we had it so-called, you know what I mean, started doing so-called Islamic music. Which um, I'm not going to get too deep in that Because I don't want to conf confuse some of the people That's not Muslims in here And they might think that You know what I mean If I get too deep into that But as the Muslims We talk on another le difference So uh, alhamdulillah Eventually I started to find out That the music that I was doing Wasn't permissible in Islam To be honest with you I knew that it wasn't permissible And I'm not saying that to non-Muslims Who think about coming a Muslim They might say Well man this is too This religion too strict We can't listen to music That ain't what's important The important thing is Knowing who your Lord is And worshiping your Lord Because we all going to drop dead So don't don't start, don't start saying, well, I don't want to be a Muslim because I like music. You can like your music, but just learn who your Lord is. And eventually, you will leave everything else alone. So when I started coming back doing music, I got around some brothers that started giving me the little, and that made me leave the music industry. But one of the things that happened, man, where I talked to the people, I went to, when I, and to be honest, I like to be straight up with the people. Before I was a Muslim, I was, used to, I was cashing checks, and this is no lie, and I'm not saying it to brag because this was, this was haram money anyway. But I was cashing checks for $150,000 like every six months, or I'd get a check for $80,000 every six months, and I would cash these checks, and I would not be happy. I would steady try to go get intoxicated. I'd go buy a brand new house, and when I buy a brand new house, I'll be happy for two days. And when I get in two or three days, I start feeling depressed again. So I, I'm chasing it down with alcohol and I'm fronting in front of the people like most of the rappers do. You see them on television. They drunk and they high and they looking like they're having a good time. But one of the things, if you have to get drunk and high, you're doing that to, because you want to feel good. So it's, it's a, obviously the people's not happy. If you have to turn into a toxic and getting high, you're searching for something. You're searching to feel good. So I was just searching. So a car will come out, a brand new car. I'll say, you know what? I want to go get that car. Maybe I get the car. That's why I'm not happy. I think I need a car, man. So I go get a car. And it was so crazy that I drive the car, and a couple days later, it's like it's nothing to me. I'm like, man, this is like temporary happiness. What is it? What am I going through? So that's when I started really trying to get more to the dean and more to the dean. I was blaming it. I said, well, maybe it's the death of my mother and father. This is why I'm not feeling like this. This is why I'm feeling this way. It wasn't until I started becoming religious and I started noticing that when Allah says in the Quran that surely the hearts found tranquility with the remembrance of the of the of the lord 
And wallahi, when I read that, I said the only time I do feel any kind of happiness is when I'm starting to read something about Islam or when I'm around Muslims and things like that. So I started trying to get more and more into the religion and learn more about the religion because, like I said, that was when true happiness was coming. And alhamdulillah, a couple, uh, uh, I tried to move overseas. I said, man, I, I got Islamic crazy. I said, man, you know what? I need to go overseas and try to sit, sit down with some scholars and something like that. And I went overseas and I, and cut the law. I was, I had to come back like four or five months later. But the main thing I wanted to tell the people, even going overseas and like going to the from the land of the Muslims, from going to like places from Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, you see some, you see some people that they doesn't take their deen seriously. That I seen little kids that when they, when I was out there, they was talking about rap music and things like that and it didn't hit me until I came back to America and I said this is a blessing that what we have this is a blessing to be a Muslim man this is a blessing to be a Muslim and one of the things we shouldn't do is take advantage of this blessing one of the things some of us is born with Muslim, from Muslim families some of us come from Muslim countries but that doesn't mean anything some of us the shaitan got us so blind because we might be Arab we might be African we might be Pakistani and then we might come from countries that have been Muslim countries for years so the shaitan will blind us and say you know what you was born a Muslim, you're gonna die a Muslim. As a matter of fact, somebody told me when I was in the Middle East, um, and she, a, a, a person told me that when I was talking to him about Islam, me and my wife, she said, "How are you gonna tell me? Because Islam is in my blood." So when you hear people saying this, it's sad, it's sad, and I'm not to clown nobody, but the shaitan can confuse us. And make us think that we somebody That make us think that we're going to die Because we born Muslim So Every single one of us Going to drop dead one day Every single one of us Every single one of us got a grave waiting for him And Allah says in the Quran that the next life is the true life. The next life is eternity. This life is, tr is temporary. It's playing amusement. This life is only playing amusement for us. We have to drop dead. There's no way in the face of the earth we're going to live forever. We're going to drop dead. So as a matter of fact, we need to return back to our, to our deen because we got to face Allah. We got to face Allah. We're going to drop dead. I don't, I don't care how cool you are. I don't care how many push-ups you can do. I don't care how many fights or how many people you knocked out. You're going to drop dead. You're going to die one day. All of us ain't going to drop dead, and it's best to drop dead knowing who the creator of the heavens and earth is. Because Allah said, man, this is easy for him to raise us, up, raise us up out the grave. This is easy for Allah to raise us again. People that have been dead thousands and hundreds of years ago, when the day of judgment come, everybody got to get raised up. Everybody got to get raised up, even to the point that the prophets, the prophets like the prophet Adam, the prophet Jesus, the prophet Abraham, the prophet, the prophet Isaac, Jacob, all these prophets that we believe in Islam. And there's many more prophets that on a day of judgment, they're going to be saying, myself, myself. They're going to be afraid. And these are prophets. They're going to be concerned with themselves on that day. And look at us, man. We're taking life like we just know that we're going to live forever. We Muslims, we don't even care about the sunnah, man. Some of us think the sunnah is obligatory, man. The sunnah is obligatory. You know, even though some of the sunnah is, you know what I mean? The sunnah salat is, but when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he command us, like do this, then it's not obligatory. So some of us need to return back to the Quran and the sunnah properly according to what the Sahabas was upon. Because there's a verse in the Quran where Allah said, those who oppose the messenger, this is translated. The translated meaning to be those who oppose the messenger and follow a way other than the way of the believers. Allah said, I will leave them what they are upon and I will land them in the hellfire. Ibn Abbas, right there, Allahu Anu, he was the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu and he was also one of the, the well-known companions who knew the Quran, Tasfir the Quran very well. He said that Allah said in that verse, the believers was us, the Sahabas, the companions of the Prophet. Allah says in the Quran, those who follow a way other than the way of Sahabas, the believers, we're going to leave you what you're upon and land you in the fire. How many of us are trying to follow the way of the believers? How many of us know who Umar ibn Khattab is? Abu Bakr, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abdul Rahman ibn Ov. How many of us know who the Sah Sahabiyats is? Because these are the people we should be trying to be like. If you ask some of the Muslims, name five or 30, 40, 50 rappers, man, they name every rapper, their birthday, Jay-Z, 50 cents, they know everybody. They don't even know the companions. This is disgusting, man. We're supposed to be Muslims, and we look up to the people that's calling us to the hellfire, that these people don't have nothing for us in this life or the next life. The people that we should look up to is the people that Allah says in the Quran, he said that the Muhajir and the, and the, 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 the Ansar, Allah is pleased with them, and they please with Allah. Allah said that he is pleased with the Sahabas. 
We want. I don't know if Allah said that He's pleased with the outlaws, or He pleased with Napoleon, or He pleased with the um these rappers. Allah said that He's pleased with the Sahabas. If we want to take some role models, why wouldn't we look up to the people that Allah said He's pleased with? Allah said that the Quran is here to the day of judgment. The Quran ain't gonna change. Allah said they're not gonna be pleased with the Sahabas and Jay Z and them come out, and then the Muslims can follow Jay Z. This is disgusting, man. We need to return back to our deen because this is, this is real talk. Like I said, man, everybody in here, Muslim or non-Muslim, you're going to drop dead. We all got to die, and then we're going to know what's the true religion. Then we're going to know what's the true religion. We're going to get raised up in front of our Lord because there's only one religion that's truth. There's only one true religion that's the haq. And there's only one way to follow that deen. There's only one way, and that religion is Islam. When Allah gave us the religion of Islam, he, he revealed it, and this is the final message the final message to mankind. So we shouldn't play this lightly. We should be happy that we Muslim because Allah says in the Quran, well, Allah doesn't even, Allah don't need us. We walking around like Allah need us, man. Allah don't need us. We need Allah. We walking around because your name Muhammad, you think you get into Jannah? Because your name is Umar, you think that gets you in Jannah? That ain't enough, bro, because you come from parents that's Hafiz. My parents is a hafiz of the Quran. You think that means I'm a hafiz of the Quran? That doesn't really mean nothing. Alhamdulillah. But the Prophet Islam said it would be some people that recite the Quran and it won't even go past their throats. Because we don't even try to know the meaning of the Quran. We don't even sit to read the Quran. We ration. And the Prophet Islam said there'd be a time where people would be learning. They would be learning for this dunya. They'll be learning to go around and say, I know this much about the Quran. I know this much about the Hadith. But we will not be implementing that. This stuff is not going to help us. When you're in that grave, when the angel of death comes smiting and smiting your face and our backs, may Allah protect us from that. They're not going to say how much Quran you know. Did you live that Quran? As a matter of fact, the most Quran you know, it could be against you or for you on the day of Yama Kiyama. Because we want Allah going to say, we imp did we implement what we know about this deen? So really though, man, we need to return back to our deen. When we look around at the, the, the Muslim nation nowadays, we blame everybody. We blame everybody about the fears of the Muslims. We run to the embassies. We march to the embassies. Half of us on our way to the embassies. We didn't pray Fajr. We listening to music to go to the embassies. And we thinking that this is going to get us success. We running around. We screaming. When the Prophet Sallallahu said that there would come a time that Allah would send punish the Muslims by sending their enemies upon them. And, they, and Allah would not let up until the Muslims return back to their deen. The Prophet Islam said the only thing that's going to free us from the humiliation that we in is if you return back to your deen. The Prophet Islam said the Muslims going to fall in love with this dunya and this is what's going to happen to us, man. He ain't say, man, Allah's going to let up when you go march at the embassies and start screaming. This is when the let, this is, no, what's going to let it up is returning back to your deen. So we truly care about the brothers and sisters in Palestine, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia. We want, we will return to our deen. If you really care about the book, because everybody say, oh, we care about the people. They run to the embassy, they scream, they go crazy. We care about our people. Man, if you care about your people, you'll run, run back to your deen. When they asked one of the scholars, I think it was Sheikh Ubaid Ibn Jabri um, from Mecca, from Medina, Hafidu Allah, when they asked him, what should we do to, we love the Prophet. What should we do to show the people we love the Prophet? Every Muslim in here, we, we love the Messenger of Allah. We love Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, but what you can do to show the people you love them when they look at you and they see that the, the Prophet that died 1,400 years ago, his religion is on your clothes, his religion is in your character, his religion in everything you do, this is how you represent the Prophet. Not running around screaming at embassies, that doesn't represent no one but barbarism. That ain't Islam has came as a quiet and peaceful religion, man. Like one of the one of one of the 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 the, the, the iman at the masjid I go to, man. He said, "You never saw Abu Bakr and, and Umar running around the Kaaba when they was getting beat up by or getting um, tortured by the Quraysh. They wasn't running around the car, the Kaaba with their picket signs marching, man. They went and learned their deen, man. The true success in this life is Islam, man. Like I said, man, true success is learning our religion. True success. I know, I know happiness, man. I had three houses at one time. I had brand new cars at one time, man. I I never been happy in my life until I found Islam. Wallahi, man, I never, I swear to God, I never been happy until I came to the religion of Islam. And they told myself, where was this religion all them years when I was searching for happiness? None of that stuff make you happy. None of this dunya is going to last. Running around trying to sell drugs and make some quick money, all this stuff's going to come to an end. The best and true success is learning who your Lord is. Knowing why you created. 
no one who created you. So as the Muslims and the non-Muslims, even if it's non-Muslims in here, I, 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 I tell you and advise you because that you should go learn about Islam. It's not going to hurt you to go learn about Islam properly instead of believing everything we see on the media. It's not going to kill you. It's, it's, the Quran is not going to blow up in your hand when you open the Quran. We should take the arrogance and pride out of our heart. Really though, because we, you're going to drop dead. And it's going to be a time if you don't accept and you don't learn or accept this deen, it's going to be a time that you're going to wish that you had time to learn about Islam. I, and that's a promise. And this is not my word This is the words of the creator of the heavens and earth This is the words of the ones who created the trees Who created the mountains Who created the, everything on the heavens and the earth These are his words The one who created us all man So as non-Muslims it's not going to hurt To try to find out about Islam Learn about the Islam Learn about the deen Learn about your religion Learn about the one who created you Because Islam is the only true success in this life man Only true happiness is not falling in love with this dunya Making a million dollars Alhamdulillah if you get that That's good Because Islam doesn't tell you You have to be broke And just sit at the masjid And stuff like that If you get your money You get your money If you do, a, if you do it according to what Allah tell you Then there's nothing wrong with that But I'm trying to tell you Money gonna run away eventually This world Women gonna run away eventually Everything gotta vanish on the day of judgment, we're going to be raised up and we're going to be alone. No one can help us. You can't run to your mommy. You can't run to your friends. You can't run to the Hennessy bottle. It's not going to be there. You can't run to the weed. It's not going to be there. You got to face your Lord. And it's not. It's no coming back. You can't say, now that I know the truth, let me go back. I promise I'll be a Muslim. It's too late for that. The hellfire is forever. Paradise is forever. That's why in this life, everything is temporary. We might be happy for a couple days, and one day we sad. No one's happy on this earth forever. No one's sad on this earth forever. The best true happiness is going to be in the next life, Jinnah, paradise. And we want true happiness. We want true happiness. When God kicked our father Adam out of heaven, he told him that he's going to send his messengers. If we follow his messengers and prophet, then we, it's a way for us to get back into heaven. So this is why we're on this earth. Everything we on this earth as a test. So the main thing is, man, please learn our deen according to the Quran and the Sunnah. And for the non-Muslims, just know that you're going to drop dead. Just know that you're going to drop dead, so it's not going to hurt you to go and try to find out what Islam is about. It's not going to hurt you, man. It's not going to hurt you, man. If you go find out what Islam is about, and if it's the truth, you follow the truth. You follow the truth. We don't follow a religion according to our desires. We shouldn't do that. We shouldn't follow a religion because it tells us we can, that somebody died for our sins and so we can do everything we want to do. Everything we want to do. We shouldn't do that, man. Because on a, even Jesus said in the Bible that the, that, that the Father cannot bear the burden of the Son and the Son cannot bear the burden of the Father. In Islam, we pray to the God who Jesus prayed to. We pray to the one who created Jesus. We pray to the one who created Adam. We pray to the one that when they said that Jesus was on the cross, in Islam, we doesn't believe this. But when he was on the cross saying, Elah, Elah, why have you forsaken me? He was calling on a God. This is the God who the Muslims pray to. As Muslims, we don't believe Jesus died on the cross. But I'm just trying to tell you to make my point that we pray to the Lord of Jesus, the Lord of Abraham, the Lord of Isaac. How can you go wrong praying to the Lord of all the prophets? How can you go wrong praying to the Lord who created the heavens and the earth? Because we got to drop dead. That's why I'm trying to stress that we going to drop dead in here. For the non-Muslims, Man, I advise y'all to go if you want happiness because nobody's not happy till you know your Lord. I don't care who you are, I don't care who you are, I don't care how much money you have, I don't care how many houses you have. It's a front. I swear to God, I know it's a front. It's a, as, a, as a matter of fact, it's a front. Nobody can say they're happy if they don't know who their Lord is. So I advise the people that's non Muslim, it's not going to hurt to go learn about Islam. It is truly a religion of peace. It is truly a religion of the, of the truth, man. It's a, it's, a, it's a religion that I think that if you go learn it and you, we practice it properly, then we'll get true, true success and true happiness. For So the non Muslims, man, just go back, man. Maybe it was a reason that y'all came here to hear this so that you could go, that your Lord is calling you to Islam. Because Allah doesn't need us, man. It's so many people that died on, uh, didn't die as a Muslim. So it's very important that you guys go learn Islam, man. The non-Muslim, go read the Quran. Go find out who the Prophet Muhammad is. Go find out who the Prophet Muhammad is, that he was so merciful to mankind, that he came as a mercy for us. So go find out this life, man, that I told you, man, that it, it, it's nothing can compare to the life of Islam. Wallahi, no money. Nothing could compare. I told you, man, I cashed checks and I had three or four houses brand new. I would never give religion, religion of Islam up for none of that stuff, man. None of that stuff can compare to the religion of Islam. And this is the true success. True success is knowing who your Lord is. 
and know who your Lord is properly, man. So go back to find out who your Lord is. And I just came to talk to the people, talk to the Muslims and the non-Muslims to let them know, man, just just try Islam, man. It's not going to hurt. And for the Muslims, man, it's embarrassing to see that Muslims not practicing their deen, right? It's very embarrassed, man, to see that Muslims following their desires. It's very embarrassed to think that we think that we're not going to drop dead, man. And the only way that we're going to practice our deen Islam properly is knowing who the Sahaba is. So instead of knowing who Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, Tupac, Outlaws, all these names, we should be knowing who the Sahaba is because this this is a matter of life and death. This is a matter of the hellfire that's real. Hellfire is real, man. So we really need to learn who the Sahaba is properly, man. And we need to practice the way they practice their deen. And we can never go wrong, inshallah. And we hold on to that, inshallah.